there are common misunderstandings about the ways in which love and justice might be in tension or opposed. Yeah. And you've done lots of work in recent years to uncover really not, not, not just an absence of tension, but, but really uh, a, a very deep conceptual interconnection between just and justice and love. Yeah. And so I, I, where do you start when you try to explain you know, what it is to uh, understand <laughs> justice as consistent and, and a very important part of love? So in my own thinking, I started <laughs> with the, uh, well, I mean, I was aware of the common theme of tension. Mm. And when I read around, it became clear to me why there was thought to be tension. Justice was understood a certain way. We can talk about that. But more important probably is the love that Jesus commands, agape, was has typically, not invariably, but typically been understood as sheer gratuitous benevolence paying no attention to what the other person needs or requires or what justice requires, but just spontaneous free benevolence. A bestowal. A bestowal, free bestowal. Just, just a sort of abundant yeah. giving as opposed to a response. Yeah. In some, right? And if that's how you think of the love that Jesus commanded, it's not all that hard to think of examples in which sheer benevolence mm. produces injustice. Recent, about two weeks ago, a friend of mine told me about an example of the very point in his, in his church. It's an um, inner city church, mm. smallish inner city church. And for the preceding two Thanksgivings, they had distributed food in, the, in this rather poor neighborhood, mm. Thanksgiving food baskets. Yeah. And then, after they'd done that a second year, the owner of a 7-Eleven store in the neighborhood came to them and said, he, bar he was barely able to keep his business going. Uh, he depended heavily on large purchases the week before Thanksgiving and the week mm -hmm. before Christmas. And now in these past two years, he'd had almost no, no customers before Thanksgiving because the church was giving out all these, all these mm -hmm. Thanksgiving food baskets. Um, so that was a case of the church wasn't aware of this. It was doing it unwittingly and it was out of it benevolence? Was, yeah, out of benevolence and charity and so forth. But it was, in fact, wronging this neighborhood 7-Eleven um, owner. Mm. So the church immediately, once they heard about this, they wonderfully said, we hadn't known about this, but next year we'll buy, all, we'll buy as much food as possible from your store yeah. and distribute it. Yeah. So it, was, uh, it struck me as a, almost a paradigmatic example of mm. benevolence, in this case, unwittingly, unwittingly perpetrating injustice. And a creative solution. Yeah, and, the, and, uh, and they had a solution. <laughs> Especially in light of you know, the, the, the great good that they were doing uh, to everyone else in that community. Yeah, uh, then also treat the, the, the store owner with. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so um, anyway, from, I guess from the very beginning of my thinking about these issues, Evan, it, it, felt, it felt to me not right to think of justice and agopic love as pitted against each other in this way. In spite of, I was perfect. I, I mean, I was aware of the long tradition of yeah. uh, thinking of them as uh, in tension with each other, but something in my gut <laughs> mm -hmm. led me to think, eh, this can't be right. I think part of it was maybe this. A lot of people who read their Bibles in English, and that <laughs> includes you and me, yep. uh, discover that the word justice occurs seldom in the, New in the English translations of the New Testament. Right and the word love occurs very often. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to think that Christianity is all about love and that ju the word justice occurs often in the English translations of the Old Testament. That's right. so, so it's very tempting to think that justice is Old Testament stuff and love is yeah. New Testament stuff. It's a real common gloss just yes. to say that the New Testament is yep. a testament of love and the Old Testament is a yep. testament of justice or wrath. Yep. Yeah. So part of what's going on here <laughs> is this. Is uh, there's a Greek word, dikaios, which D-I-K-A-I-O-S. When I was a college student, I studied classical Greek first, and we read Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic is all about dikaios, mm -hmm. and my, my memory is it's, we were just taught to translate it as justice. The Republic is about justice. Oh. Uh, then in my 
third or fourth college year, I took New Testament Greek. I found the same Greek word dikaios occurring all over the place in the New Testament, and it was translated as righteousness. Mm. So at the time I, you know, wondered about that. Dikaios in Plato is justice, and dikaios in the New Testament is righteousness. So I asked my professor, and he didn't give me much of an answer, he just said, well, yeah, it means righteousness. Uh, I've come to doubt that very mm. much. Mm. Sometimes in the New Testament, dikaios means righteousness, I do concede, but uh, often it does not. Here's one example. In the Beatitudes, the eighth Beatitude in Matthew is, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of dikaiosune. Every English translation that I know of translates it as, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Now righteousness is a character trait, right? Justice is a social relationship. How many, so, 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 so I put my head to that and asked myself, how many upright people, upright people, do I know of who are persecuted? Upright people are typically either ignored or admired, but they're not persecuted. Mm -hmm. It's the people who struggle for justice who get under other people's skin mm -hmm. and, you know, stir up anger. Uh, murdered and so forth. I, I'm a supporter of and an admirer of an organization in Honduras, Association for a More Just Society. Mm -hmm. AJS um, works hard at justice. And three years ago, one of their one of their lead lawyers was assassinated at point mm -hmm. blank range on a street in Tegucigalpa. Mm -hmm. um, they they stir up anger. Um, they become a threat to the oppressor. Yeah. yeah. So I think. I think the uh, eighth beatitude should be translated as, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice. Mm. Mm. That's an evocative translation. <laughs> That's good. I can give other examples. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, one other example. Um, uh, evangelicals, when they read the book of Romans, typically leap in to the middle of the second chapter where Paul starts talking about justification. Mm. Sort of ignore what precedes that. But in 117, Paul states the theme of the book. And he says it's the, the theme of the book is the dikaiosune of God. Mm. Every, here we go again, every English translation that I know of translates that as the righteousness of God. Mm. But then you read along and you find that what Paul says uh, many times over in the book is that God treats Jews and Gentiles with no partiality. The phrase no partiality occurs six times in the book of Romans. Mm. So that's the theme. Yeah. Now that no partiality seems to, seems to me God treats Jews and Gentiles justly, equitably. Not, it's not the righteousness of God, it's the justice of God. Mm. Mm. That is the theme of Romans. Yeah. 